So we're going to talk about St. Catherine La Beret. Um, Saint you may or may not have heard of before. Let's just say a quick prayer to kind of settle in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for um, getting us through this past winter. Thank you for giving us a nice warm day. And uh, just, you know, thank you for all the things that you provide for us. Uh, shelter and clothing and food and all the stuff that we have that so many people in the world do not have. Help us appreciate those gifts from you. We ask that you send St. Catherine Labore to be with us here tonight so that uh, she can not only help me um, hit the highlights of her life, but so that she can help open the hearts of the students, the catechists, to what she might want to, uh, what point she might want to get across to them tonight about her life. And so, uh, again, we're just grateful to you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here. Please keep us safe in our church. Please keep our churches safe as well with all the craziness going on in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, St. Catherine La Barre, um, as her last name would indicate, she is from France. She um, was born a little over 200 years ago. Um, she's a very important saint in terms of 19th century church history. And not just for that purpose, but also um, there was uh, repercussions that affect us today as well based on, on her life experience. And so she was born in 1806. Um, she was one of 11 children that survived in her family. Her mother had 17 children, but a number of them died in infancy. Um, she was the ninth one that survived and she, um, she, but she was the second girl. They had a lot of boys ahead of her. And so she, uh, um, you know, they were a farm family. Um, they were a farm family that was doing pretty good. Her dad was a pretty, um, he, was, he was a good businessman. And so he had a farm, he had like about a dozen farm hands, had a fair amount of land, um, which was very successful in how he ran his business. And so, they, you know, they weren't super rich, but they, uh, they had plenty and they were able to have a number of workers working for them as well. Um, so Catherine, um, you know, she and her mother were very, very close. Um, I think maybe because there was such a big distance between her older sister and her. Uh, and I think that's part of it. So her and her mother just became very close. Um, and that's, that's kind of how it was in, in those days because it tended to be that the women would, you know, do the, do the housework and the men tended to work out in the fields. And it's just the, the division of labor as it was. And so um, they came from a very pious Catholic family. Um, the father had actually studied in the seminary, but it had just turned out. Um, and his mother was just from a very strong Catholic family. And so it was a good match. They, they went to church often in the little town where um, she was born. And it's, it's a French name and I'll butcher it, but it's, it's just a little town of like 150 people. They, like I said, they, they were, um, I should say Catholic enough, but they were just well established at the church that they had a, a, a little shrine in the church to the Labore family. Okay, and so so they were uh, they were big supporters of their church, and um, you know they, they spent they spent a lot of time there. They went to they went to daily mass when they could, um, but they also worked very hard at their farm. And so as as she grew up, she had a, a sister uh, who was about two years younger than her, named Antoinette, and they were also very close. So it's kind of like the mother uh, and uh, Catherine and Antoinette when. Catherine was baptized, they gave her the baptismal name of Zoe. And so basically for her entire childhood, they called her Zoe. Um, but her, her given name was Catherine, but her baptismal name was Zoe. And so sometimes you might see that in writing Zoe Labore, um, you know, in terms of um, think about the history of her life. Um, when Catherine was about nine, nine and a half years old, um, her mother suddenly died. And um, you know, they didn't really give a cause of death. And here it says in the records, there really wasn't a cause of death. Um, but it, it sounds like it happened reasonably suddenly. It wasn't a long drawn out illness. She was only 42 years old. So it must've been something, you know, something extreme or maybe, you know, in those days, you know, in the 1820s, there was diseases and, and uh, epidemics and, and all these kinds of things that were going through. And so you just never knew. Um, like she said, six of her children died too. And so, there, you know, mortality rates were higher. People didn't live as longer. Um, and so, so I, suddenly at about nine and a half, Catherine was without her mother. And about this time, um, one of her older sisters was like 18 and she was contemplating going off to become a nun. And that put this off for a little bit. 
Um, so Catherine and her sister Antoinette, they weren't really old enough. They were old enough to help around the house, but they weren't able to really run the house. So one of their aunts and uncles um, who lived about 10 miles away said, you know, if you'd like, you know, we'll take the girls for a time so she can get your affairs in order. And you know, this is to, to the, her dad. So you can get your affairs in order, get the business running well, um, you know, and, and kind of take care of all that other stuff. Um, and you just don't have as many small kids to watch. There was also another brother that was younger than Antoinette who, um, he was always a little sickly, but he also got into an accident and so he was crippled. So they, they took him as well. And so they needed to kind of free up the father so he could make sure that the farm continued to run. Well, suddenly it was like two years later and almost almost three years later and so the girls were like 12 and 10 and um, because the older sister was preparing to go off to the convent um, they, you know they determined that they needed to send the girls home and they had they had uh, learned a lot with their aunt and their uncle um, and in addition to what their mother had taught them and during this time um, I can't I don't know if it was bef like as she was still at home or when she was with her aunt or uncle but Catherine, um, Catherine, you know, had a, a devotion to the Blessed Mother, and she saw this statue up on a shelf, and she pushed this chair over, and she climbed up, and she grabbed the statue, and she held the statue to her chest and said, since my mother is gone, you're going to be my mother now. And we see this in other saints. Same thing happened to John Paul II when his mother died when he was like seven or eight. Um, he said to Mary, Mary, you're going to be my mother now. Um, and so um, from that time on, she just had just such a strong devotion to Mary. Mary was real to her. Like she couldn't see her, she couldn't hear her, but Mary was real to her. And she really felt that Mary was truly watching over her. And so the girls come home, uh, at, like I said, about ages 12 and 10, and they start running the household. And again, there's, there's still some of the boys at home. A number of them had gone off to business and things like that because a lot of them were older than Catherine. And the sister went off to the convent, but Catherine and Antoinette started running the house, you know, running, taking care of the meals and, and, and doing all the things, you know, to kind of make sure everything ran. And again, remember, they had like 12 to 14 um, hired hands. And so they were living on premises as well. So they were providing meals for them and just making the whole household run. And they were, got really good at it. Um, and so, um, so good that, that uh, you know, the, the father just couldn't see how, you know, he's like, you know, since my wife is gone, you know, his plan was is that the girls would stay and help him run the farm, um, even, even beyond um, when they became adults. And so um, Catherine gets to be about 17, 18 years old, and she starts feeling the pull toward religious life. Um, and, you know, but, you know, she doesn't, she, she knows that she can't leave her father. And so she just continues working and, and um, you know, helping run the farm. Well, one night when she's about 18, 18 and a half years old, she has this dream. And um, I just wanna read from this because this tells it better than I could. But this is, um, it says, one night in 1824, when, when she was 18, Zoe had an extraordinary dream. She dreamed that she was in her favorite oratory, the chapel of the Labores in the village church, assisting at the mass of an old and venerable, venerable priest she had never seen before. Each time the priest turned from the altar for the Dominus Vobiscum, he raised his eyes to Zoe's face and held her gaze. Each time she was forced to lower her eyes, blushing, unable to hold the steady and compelling eyes of the priest. When mass was over and the old man had started for the sacristy, he turned back and beckoned to Zoe to follow him. She was suddenly very frightened and jumping to her feet ran from the church. She glanced back over her shoulder as she ran, and the priest was still there, standing by the sacristy door, looking after her. Then the thought came to Zoe in her dream to stop to visit a woman in the village who was sick. On entering the sick room, she came face to face with the same venerable priest. Wild fright seized her again, and she began to back away. For the first time then, the priest spoke directly to her. You do well to visit the sick, my child. You flee from me now, but one day you will be glad to come to me. God has plans for you. Do not forget it. At these words, Zoe awoke and lay wondering what it all could mean. And strangely enough, there was no more fear in her, only peace and comfort and a great happiness. Although she did not understand it then, this dream was sent to Zoe by God to point out with certainty the vocation of his choice. And so, you know, at that point, she knew that she needed to go to religious life. And so she, you know, like, like all kids at that time did and 
should still do now, is they went, she went to speak to her father and said, this is what I feel called to do. And her father, again, you know, um, his wife had been dead about nine, 10 years at this point. And his plan, like I said, was to have Catherine and Antoinette help run the, run the farm. And uh, he said, no, no, absolutely not, you know. So, you know, instead of kind of, you know, just disobeying her father, she said, okay, you know, this, is, this must be God's will. I'm gonna, you know, obedience to her was very strong. And she says, I'm gonna be obedient. Um, regardless of what I want, <clears throat> God's got something in this for me. And so, um, so I'm gonna obey my father. Well, during this time, she also had three marriage proposals. And her father, um, you know, and in those days, you know, the, the, the boy would go to the father and he would ask permission to marry the daughter. And the father, because his plan was to have his daughters run his house, you know, he kind of took a little kind of weird delight in seeing them come, asking Zoe. She turned it down because she wanted to go on a religious life. And then he got kind of a charge out of telling the boy no. And for him, it was kind of like this, you know, well, you know, my daughter's, you know, good enough to be a wife and she's pretty enough and they want to be her husband and no. You know, and so he just kind of thought that was kind of cool, which is a little weird, you know, but that's that's kind of where he was um and so uh but but zoe she just became less and less happy um she just she really was feeling this call to religious life she knew that um you know that she was being called but she just couldn't figure a way out of this well during this time one of her her older siblings who most of were in paris at the time kind of started talking about this they knew that that uh, zoe had this calling and so they kind of got together and said you know maybe we ought to see if um We'll talk to, to Father and we'll ask him to send her to help us um, in our businesses or at our homes and things like that, and maybe that will help. And so one of her brothers owned a restaurant in Paris, and so uh, her father agreed to this and thought, you know, maybe this will get this idea of religious life out of her head, too. Well, she gets there, and this wasn't like some, you know, charming little French restaurant. This was a dive. Right? And it was just really bad, and there was like really rough people that came in there. And Zoe just, you know, she just became sadder and sadder. Um, so another one of the um, brothers and his wife, and the wife happened to be related to her late mother, um, they said, well, let us take her. And this, this wife had a finishing school where they would teach, you know, women, you know, how to be of upper society and things like that. And uh, um, the father said, okay, yeah, that's, you know, all right, you know, let's, you know, that's not exactly what I was thinking, but at least she'll get an education now because she didn't have much of a formal education at that point. She was like around 20 years old and she didn't know how to read or write or any that kind of stuff yet or very, very little. And so she went, uh, went and she got to know her aunt and with her brother, or not her aunt, her, um, her sister-in-law and her brother and lived with them for a while. And, uh, and she, she started liking that. She started learning. She started, you know, they, and they were very, very faith-filled as well. And, uh, and, and she started joining, but she still felt called a religious life. And so her uh, uh, sister-in-law knew this. And so she said, you know what, I'm going to approach your father with this because since she was the sister of, or the sister or cousin or something of his late wife, she, goes, she kind of was one of the father's favorites. And so she goes and talks to him and they don't know what was really said, but whatever she said, he finally said, okay, fine, fine. She can go into religious life. And that's what they really wanted. They wanted the permission, okay? Um, but, he, but he was a little bit upset about this, but he said, I'm not gonna give you a dowry. Now, a dowry is a sum of money or, or goods or something like that that they would give the daughter um, to start their family or to start in religious life. And in religious life, you needed this money to be able to pay for your, your habits and you know, you know, some basic expenses. Um, and so that was kind of rude. Um, that's what it said. They said it was kind of more out of spite that he did this, um, that if you're gonna do this, you're gonna do it on your own. And, um, and the, uh, her sister-in-law and her brother said, that's fine, we've got money, we'll, we'll provide that for you. And so that was a real blessing to her. Um, and so they, they took her to uh, one place and she was uh, near a place called Chantillon, which um, might sound a little familiar to you guys. We talked about that place with another saint a couple of months ago. Well, he'll come into the picture in a second here. Um, but she goes in to this place and it was the Sisters of Charity and she goes inside and she sits down and they were going to talk to the nuns there. And it was at this hospice that they ran because they were caring for the sick and the elderly. And she sits down and looks up and on the wall is this picture, this really big picture of a priest. And she looks at the picture and she's like, that's the priest from my dream. 
a dream that she had had like four or five years earlier. And she said to the sister, she said, who is that? She's, and she didn't tell him why. But she said, who is that priest? And he says, oh, that's our founder. That's St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and she knew at that moment, she's like, I know that that's the priest in my dream. And so she went to her confessor, who she had at the time, and she told him, and he, she said, and the confessor said, well, it must be that St. Vincent de Paul wants you in his Sisters of Charity. And so she felt very affirmed that this was indeed the right path for her. And so this is in about 1828 or so. And so um, she talked to them, and they they accepted her as, as a, what they call a postulate. And a postulate is... Um, someone who's basically there for a while, she's kind of checking the place out, but they're also checking her out just to kind of make sure it's going to be a good match. And so she's, she's doing that, and, um, and things are going pretty well. And after a couple of months, they say, okay, yeah, you can join the novitiate, which means that you're officially, you're, you're called sister, you start doing your training, you wear a different habit, but you are basically part of the order at this point in time. You're like a nun in training. And so she's just, she's very thrilled about this. She just knows that this is where she's supposed to be because of the priest, and he's the founder, and he appeared in her dream, and this is all finally starting to come together. She had suffered, you know, just all this knowing what she was supposed to do, and yet she wasn't able to do it. But she went about it the right way, right? She didn't just, you know, go, I'm going to be disobedient, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm free to choose whatever. Um, she didn't do that, um, and, she, and so her persistence paid off. So anyway, this was in, um, so she did, she became a novitiate in um, early April of 1830. And that's important because um, some of you guys probably know what was going on in France before that. The French Revolution happened in the 1790s, and it was a really terrible time to be a Catholic. I mean, if you wanted to be a martyr, it was a great time to be a Catholic because you were probably going to be martyred. Um, they were killing Catholics right and left. And literally, they had an oath of fidelity to the state. It was a very secular government. And they would literally go into churches, and they would pull the priests or the nuns out, and they would say, say the oath of fidelity or die. They wouldn't say it. They'd take them to the guillotine and lop their head off. And they just they were doing this regularly. And a lot of priests and nuns died during about a 10-year period there, um, just for, right before Zoe died. Um, but they started coming out of that around the time she was born, um, but the, the atmosphere of things was still very anti-Catholic, very secular government still, very anti-Catholic. And so during that time, because the, ch the state would take over the churches and they would take all the, the valuable things out of there, they would also take like the relics and the, the bodies of the saints that they had on display and things like that. So they hid the body of St. Vincent de Paul so that the state wouldn't come in and take it and destroy it or burn it, you know, because they were also burning churches. They were, it was just a really mess of a time. Um, and so over the next couple of decades, as things, as the climate kind of settled down a little bit, some of these relics started reappearing. They started putting them in, first they put them in very safe places, and then they moved them to the places where, you know, they knew it was, you know, it was pretty safe, and then finally to the places where they really wanted to put them. And so the goal was to build uh, like a cathedral or a church for St. Vincent de Paul. And so they started doing this in like the late 1820s. Well, in about 1815, they had the body of St. Vincent de Paul in the convent where St. Catherine Labore was doing her novitiate in Rue de Bac, which was close to the Chantillon. But this is where she was. And so the body of St. Vincent de Paul was there. And after a time, they moved it to uh, Notre Dame. So by the time she's a nun, they are getting ready to move the body of St. Vincent de Paul from Notre Dame to its final place in the St. Lazar uh, Church, which if you guys remember anything about the St. Vincent de Paul talk that I gave, that's a place where St. Vincent de Paul had taken it and renovated in their 1600s. Okay, and so they had renovated again. This was going to be the church where his body was going to lay in state. And so she's been a novitiate about two weeks. And they're starting to pray this novena to St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and they had a relic of his in the church. And every day when they pray, they would pray the novena at St. Lazar, then they come back to the church, and then they would pray. And she was praying near the relic of St. Vincent de Paul. And every day for nine days, she had a vision of St. Vincent de Paul's heart that levitated above the relic. And every day that heart was a different color. And they, you know, they're in the reading I did, it said what the colors were and what they meant and things like that. But, but it, was, it was 
kind of uh, like prophetic to the times that they were in. And so out of obedience, she had to tell us to her confessor. So she's been like in this place like two weeks and she's got to tell her confessor, I'm having visions. Okay. And this is, you know, this is like, this is not what you want to tell your confessor when you've started, when you're just starting in place. So her priest was, her confessor was a priest named Father uh, Aladell. And he was, he was only like five years older than her. So, um, so they, they had a good relationship. It wasn't like he was 40 years older than her, wasn't going to listen. So he was pretty open-minded about things. And he's, so he didn't dismiss it, but he didn't really accept it. He kind of said, okay, you know, let's, you know, just keep praying and keep telling me what's going on and, and we'll see. And he didn't know, is this a dream? Is this just her making this up or whatever? But she seemed to be pretty pious. And so they didn't, they didn't think that she was lying about it. Um, so April comes and goes, May, June, July. July comes around and um, she's been there about three months now. And so July 18th rolls around. Uh, in that evening, uh, when Catherine goes to bed, and they went to bed pretty early, because uh, they were nuns, because they were up pretty early in the morning, um, Catherine was just restless. She just couldn't, uh, she just couldn't calm down that night. She was really, she just felt like something was gonna happen. And in her prayer to Mary that night, she's like, Mary, you know, I, one of these days I just really wanna see you because you know, I, I'm missing my mother and I'm in this convent and things are going great, but she's just, you know, I just feel so close to you, I wanna be, I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. And so, uh, so she finally falls asleep. Probably a couple hours later, she's awoken to the sound of a child's voice in her room. And she kind of wakes up and she looks and there's this child of about four or five years old standing next to her bed, kind of dressed all in white, you know, very glowing. Um, and says, she looks at him and the, and the child says, the Blessed Mother wants to see you. And he had said that to kind of wake her up as well. And she kind of shakes out the cobwebs, doesn't know if this is a dream or if this is real, but she wakes up and she puts on the rest of her habit and um, the child starts leading her out of the room. And so she starts following the child out of the room. And, you know, this is, okay, this is 1830, right? There's no light switches, right? With the, the, the lighting are these little porches and candles and things like that in the hallways. Well, either they're already lit or as the child walks by, they start lighting. And... She's kind of amazed by this, but her thought went to, well, what if some of the other sisters who are up caring for the sick, what if they find out? What if they see us? Then we're going to be in trouble. Um, but the child just keeps leading her. The Blessed Mother wants to see you. The Blessed Mother wants to see you. And so she follows the child, and he uh, gets to the door of the church, and the door is open to the church, um, but he doesn't touch them. They just open. And inside, all the candles in the church are lit. Again, it's not like here with all these electric lights. It's the candlelight. And, um, but she said, she commented that later on that it was lit up like midnight mass uh, on Christmas Eve. Uh, and, and so it was just, it was just a blaze with light in the church and it's almost midnight. And he, he starts walking over towards uh, where the presider's chair is. And Father Rob's chair is over there. So that's the chair we're talking about. And, uh, he says, the Blessed Mother wants to see you. He just kind of keeps saying that over and over again. And she doesn't see anybody, but she kneels down and starts to pray kind of just outside the sanctuary. Well, suddenly she hears kind of this swooshy noise like a, like a fabric and like a, like a silk dress, she said. And she looks up and this beautiful woman in a silk dress kind of walks over towards the presider's chair and sits down. And she realizes this is Mary. And Mary identifies herself as Mary. And... Catherine runs over to the chair and she kneels down and she places her hands and her head in Mary's lap and and just this very mother and daughter kind of um, just the reaction right and she, she's just she's just so happy to see her and Mary starts talking with her <clears throat> and over the course of the next two hours Mary um, tells her about things that are going to happen um, not only to her but in the world um, at times, Mary is so choked up with emotion that she is crying. So it's not like Mary's just talking and she's all just kind of unemotional. <clears throat> Again, it's a very human um, conversation that Catherine is having with Mary. And so uh, she tells her lots of things, uh, lots of things that are going to happen, um, some distressing things. So there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. There's going to be a lot of uh, killing. There's going to be you know, a lot of turmoil in the government. Um, you know, there's going to be more priests that are going to be killed or they're going to lose their, 
uh, you know, their their parishes and things like that. And um, Catherine got the distinct impression that it would be sometime in the next 40 years. But Mary also talked about other things that were going to happen sooner. And so after a couple of hours, um, the child escorts Mary um, back to her cell. <clears throat> Mary tries to settle in, but she, you know, she hears the clock strike two o'clock um, and then she doesn't sleep the rest of the night. But she wakes up the next morning and realizes, I've got to tell my confessor this story now. Um, and, you know, the first one was kind of just a vision. Now it's like, I've seen the Blessed Mother. How is he going to take this? So she talks with Father Allodel and, uh, um, you know, in much the same way. I mean, he was a little bit more disbelieving, but he wasn't going to dismiss it entirely. <clears throat> and he says, okay, well, let's, you know, let's just keep praying. Let's see what happens. Um, but he wasn't going to believe everything she said either because he's like, well, this could have been a dream. Uh, but in, within the next week, a uh, three-day revolt breaks out near them. And basically some of the prophecies that Mary was saying of things that were about to happen come true. <clears throat> and there are people riding in the streets and they're burning things and they're pulling people out of their houses and they're pulling priests out of churches. And it's just a lot of violence. And it's a lot of the same kind of thing that we're actually starting to see now, unfortunately. Um, that type of that type of just stupidity, you know, of just people just freaking out and rioting and carrying on. Um, and nothing justifies that, okay? But Mary had promised, she said that <clears throat> through all this, I will protect your order. And then the men who were the Vincentians, I will protect them as well. So, you know, um, these are coming, but don't worry, I will protect you. And there was a couple times in that three days where the people were gathering like right outside the convent and they were gonna storm the place. And for whatever reason, they just dispersed. And, um, you know, only Mary, or excuse me, only Catherine and Father Allidel knew this, but both of them realized that Mary was true to her word. Father Allidel's like, okay, there might be something to these things that she's seen. I mean, I'm not ready to believe it, you know, all of it just yet, but there's, you know, what she was t telling me is now happening. So, um, you know, they, you know, as a confessor, she has regular spiritual direction with him and is going to confession. Not much more in terms of apparitions happens for the next four or five months. Um, summer leads into fall, um, and suddenly we're at the end of November, uh, November 27th, 1830. And this is the eve, the vigil of the first Sunday of Advent um, for 1830. And um, Catherine is in prayer. She's with her sisters. They're just in the chapel and they're praying. And suddenly Mary appears. Now only Catherine can see her. And so the other nuns kind of noticed that like, she was in this uh, state of ecstasy. Um, basically she was non-responsive, um, but they knew she was just completely consumed with prayer. Um, and and it's, it's really interesting, um, you know, what Catherine Roy writes about this. And I'm just gonna read a little bit of it here. And it says, suddenly Catherine's heart leapt. She had heard it, that rustling, that faint swish. Sorry. The faint swish of silk that she could never forget. The sound of Our Lady's gown as she walked. There it was again. And there was the Queen of Heaven, there in the sanctuary, standing upon a globe. She shone as the morning rising, a radiant vision in all her perfect beauty, said Catherine later. Yet they were not so dazzled, but that woman-like, excuse me, yet they were not so dazzled, but that woman-like, they took note of every detail of Virgin's dress, that her robe was of silk of the whiteness of the dawn, that the neck of it was cut high and the sleeves plain, that she wore a white veil which fell to her feet, and beneath the, the veil a lace fillet binding her hair. The Virgin held in her hand a globe ball which she seemed to offer to God, for her eyes were raised heavenward. Mary lowered her eyes and looked full at Sister Labore. Her lips did not move, but Catherine heard a voice. The ball which you see represents the whole world, especially France, and each person in particular. These rays symbolize the graces I shed upon those who ask for them. The gems from which rays do not fall are the graces for which souls do not ask. So Mary had set her hands out like this, and there was rays coming out of her fingers, and there was gems in the rings that were on her fingers, and some of them had rays of light coming out and some did not. So that's what she's referring to here, is that the rays that uh, are coming out from the, from the brilliant stones are the graces that people are receiving. The ones that are dark and there are no rays are coming out, those are the graces that people don't ask for but should. 
Um, at this moment, Catherine was so lost in delight that she scarcely knew where she was, whether she lived or died. The golden ball vanished from Mary's hands. Her arms swept wide in a gesture of motherly compassion, while from her jeweled fingers the rays of light streamed upon the white globe at her feet. An oval frame formed around the Blessed Virgin and written within it the letters of gold, and Catherine read these words. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. The voice spoke again. Have a medal struck after this model. All who wear it will receive great graces. They should wear it around the neck. Graces will abound for persons who wear it with confidence. The, the medal revolved, and Catherine beheld the reverse of the medal she was to have made. It contained a large M surmounted by a bar and a cross. Beneath the M were the hearts of Jesus and Mary, the one crowned with thorns, the other pierced with a sword. Twelve stars encircled the whole. And then the vision was gone. And so Mary's asking a lot of her here. Um, she was showing her, telling her about the symbolism, again, the rays coming out of her hands. And when you look at a miraculous medal, of which I'm going to give you all one uh, yet tonight, you'll see Mary's hands on the side. You've seen this picture before where it looks like there's just rays coming out of her fingers. And this is, shows that Mary is what's called the mediatrix of all graces. Right? Of course, grace comes from God and, and, and through Christ, but it also then comes, they, they direct it through Mary, and, and she is the one who directs the graces, is the way it's explained. And so, um, Catherine's like, I gotta tell this to my confessor. Um, I have to do it. You know, out of obedience, I am to tell him all the things that I'm experiencing. And this is true for all nuns, not just for those that see visions, right? They, they, this is part of their spiritual development. A lot of people would talk about their prayer life and about their spiritual life and what, whether it's, you know, fruitful or dry or whatever. But um, certainly when they're having visions like this, um, you know, they need to communicate that to their spiritual director. And so uh, she, the next day she's talking with Father Aladell and He's kind of at the point where he's like, okay, this is, this is almost too much now. Um, you know, I mean, because the other one's okay, you saw this stuff, but now she's asking you to do things and things that are not particularly easy. Um, and so they actually, you know, not like angrily, but they they have a, they have they're starting to have some disagreements about this. And she's very firm, and he's he's just kind of challenging her on this. You know, not in a mean way, but you know. I need proof before I do what you're asking me to do. I mean, that, that's legit, right? That's legit for him to ask her to do that. And so, uh, um, so Mary, in that vision, had also said that um, she was going to no longer appear to her visually, but that she would still be in her prayers. So, you know, whether that means she was actually uh, audible to her or whether it was just very strong intuition was coming into her heart, um, she would still have communication with Mary, but not the visions any longer. But then it did say that um, because things weren't going so well with Father Aladell, Mary gave her, um, it said gave her the vision, but it said she didn't appear either, so I'm not sure exactly what that meant. But five, at least five more times, Mary communicated with um, uh, Catherine, you know, what needed to be done. And so there was a sense of urgency about this. Um, and it got to the point so much where she was, <laughs> Catherine was in with her confessor and she said, well, maybe Mary ought to get somebody else to do this because nobody's listening to me. And that kind of offended her confessor um, because it was kind of like she was talking badly about the Blessed Mother. And, um, and so he started to take a little bit more note of this. And so he started an investigation as, as well he should have. Um, and so over the course of the next year, year and a half, it, 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 he became pretty apparent to him that what she was saying, there was merit to it. Um, and there was nothing theologically incorrect about it. Uh, and so, um, so he worked on getting the metal made. And uh, they, they worked with a local um, jeweler and, and they started getting these metals produced. There was one point where they, when uh, he asked her about the back of the metal, because on the back, again, there's just the two hearts down at the bottom, this M with the cross kind of woven through it and then the 12 stars around it. That's really all that's there. And he's like, you know, should there be, shouldn't there be some words on here? And so Catherine went back and prayed to Mary and it became apparent to her through her prayer that Mary was telling her that the symbolism that was there was all that was needed. And so um, in her discussions with Father Aladell, though, Catherine was very adamant about one thing in particular, and she said, nobody can know my identity. 
And I don't recall if Mary had told her that or if she just, you know, wanted, she was that humble and she, she knew that if she, um, cause she knew, she knew about, you know, different, uh, saints in history. And when miracles were attributed to them, people just flocked to them and then it became about them and not about Jesus and not about Mary. And so she didn't want that. Um, it also meant that they could be, you know, openly persecuted. People would mock them, and she didn't need that either. And so, so Father Allen said, "Well, this is going to be extremely difficult to to make this medal and to have this done if if we nobody can talk to you about this." Um, but he said, "But I'll do the best I can with that." And so, the superior of the order knew about it as well, and those were the only two people that knew the secret. And during this time, uh, Catherine took her her final vows. Um, she could have been transferred anywhere, but she was transferred somewhere else uh, within Paris. She was working at a hospice. I believe it was the hospice that she first walked in the door of. Um, I think it was St. Etienne's, which is St. Stephen. Uh, and that's where she wound up. Um, that's where she had seen the picture of um, St. Vincent de Paul. I, don't quote me on that, but I think that's the same place. And that's where she spent the next 40 years. 40 to 45 years was serving in that hospice and caring for the sick and the poorest of the poor and those that were dying and living the regular life of a nun and keeping that secret. Um, and the nuns in the convent you know, knew, eventually they kind of knew that somebody in that convent was the one that this, uh, the secret of the miraculous medal had been revealed to, but they didn't know who it was. Um, a couple of people asked Catherine, but I think everybody was asking everybody, right? And nobody was nobody was fessing up to it. Um, over the next uh, 40 years, her father, Aladell, like I said, he was only five years older, so he was her confessor throughout her life. Um, and then the Mother Superior asked her to write down her visions three separate times. Once in the early 1840s, once in the mid-1850s, and I think once in the 1870s. And I... I, I think they just wanted to make sure that it was recorded for posterity because they, you know, there had been so much, uh, the miraculous medal had so many miracles that were being attributed to it almost right off the bat that it was becoming a very strong devotion. And again, it's not that this medal has any magical powers to it. This medal is, uh, as sacramentals are, they, they point us to God. Um, they are a sign of our devotion. Now, when we are praying to this, we are we are recalling that vision of Mary, and we are we are um, we are visualizing that. And we as humans need that. We as humans need like a tactile thing. We need something in our hands. We need something that we can wrap our minds around. And when you think about it, that's like why Jesus came to Earth, right? Why why God became man? Because you know, in the Old Testament, God was talking through the prophets, and the prophets were saying, you know, the Lord said, and, and He would speak, and, and that was all good. But the people were you know, and it wasn't like God's like, well, this isn't working. I got to figure something else out. No, he knew what his plan was, but it had to be um, revealed over time. But having Jesus now, we can look at him and we can go, here's what he did in his life. I mean, this is stuff that's recorded. We now know how to act because we've seen it. We have the stories. We have the, the documentation of that. And so we as humans need physical things. And so that's why we have crucifixes and statues and stations of the cross and, and, that's why Jesus gave us the Eucharist. He gave us the Eucharist so that we would have something real. And and through our belief, we believe that we're actually consuming him, right? So again, it's a, it's a physical... Uh, now, the Eucharist is holy and is it's not like a sacramental. The Eucharist is Jesus. And so, um, but, but we as humans need that, okay? And God knows that. He created us. And, that's why, uh, and so that's why we have those things in the church. So Catherine dies in uh, the end of the year, uh, uh, December 31st, 1876, the age of 70. Um, and by the end of her life, a couple people had kind of figured it out. Um, and a few people were like, yeah, that makes sense that it was her. And a few people were kind of like, what, her? You know, I mean, they, they didn't, you know, they weren't, they were like, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. Um, and so, uh, you know, so her case for canonization uh, comes up about 20 years later. Um, they exhume her body and it turns out she's totally incorrupt. In fact, her skin is still soft and supple to the touch, meaning it's, it would feel like your skin is right now, um, but she was still dead. Um, and now being incorrupt is not a, a condition of sainthood, but it certainly um, is a contributing factor that helps us go, okay, there's something special going on here and helps alert us to, to the reality of what, uh, what might be going on. And so, um, but even then, the process of, of canonization takes a while. She is not beatified until 1933. So what is that? 60 years after she died? 60-ish years after she died? 
Um, and she's not canonized until 1947, so like 75 years after she dies uh, is when she's canonized. But by now, by, by this time, there's millions of miraculous medals out there, okay, and, and a huge devotion to this medal of uh, the um, the medal of the Immaculate Conception, otherwise known as the Miraculous Medal. Um, this medal, like I said, is, is very important to the 19th century church because um, it, through the uh, you know, through that saying, you know, uh, O Mary, who was conceived without sin, uh, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. It is um, it's some of the proof that was used to uh, promulgate the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, and that didn't happen until 1854, right? This isn't the only proof, but this is this is kind of one of the things that solidified it that when this apparition became public, Mary is telling us that this is true, and so this is part of the revealed truth. Now again, they didn't just think of this at that time, this had been a tradition of the church, but it became more and more important. And finally, um, uh, the Pope at the time, uh, Pope, Pope Pius IX, he, um, he promulgated the, the dogma of uh, the Immaculate Conception, okay? uh, the fact that Mary was conceived without sin. And so, so it's very important, uh, and, and it, it kind of starts what they call the age of Mary, okay? And so, so there's, there's just so much important to this from a saint that we may or may not have heard of before. I think most of us heard of, have heard of the Miraculous Medal, but I would encourage you to wear it. Um, I'm going to give you each a, uh, a, a copy of it tonight, I guess, or, you know, your own Miraculous Medal. I would encourage you to wear it around your neck. Um, and again, not as a good luck charm, but as something to point your devotion to Mary to. Give your, in the morning, give your medal a kiss. You know, like we do that with our scapulars, not because you love metal, but because you're kissing your devotion to Mary, right? And that's a, that's a very visible sign for us, again, as humans, um, to, to show that devotion to Mary. I mean, we do that in our prayer life as well, um, but, but it, it, that's okay to do that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, I guess that's it. Do you have any questions at all? All right, so uh, for our uh, journaling time tonight, uh, you can take out your journals and turn to the next blank page. And wherever that is, you can put on there Wednesday, May 11th, 2022. And the title is The Obstacle in Our Path. And I want you to think about this in light of Catherine's life, some of the obstacles that she faced and how she dealt with those, okay? In ancient times, a king had a boulder placed on a roadway. He then hid himself and watched to see if anyone would move the boulder out of the way. Some of the king's wealthiest merchants and courtiers came by and simply walked around it. Many people loudly blamed the king for not keeping the roads clear, but none of them did anything about getting the stone out of the way. A peasant then came along carrying a load of vegetables. Upon approaching the boulder, the peasant laid down his burden and tried to push the stone out of the road. After much pushing and straining, he finally succeeded. After the peasant went back to pick up his vegetables, he noticed a purse lying in the road where the boulder had been. The purse contained many gold coins and a note from the king explaining that the gold was for the person who removed the boulder from the roadway. The moral of the story. Every obstacle we come across in life gives us an opportunity to improve our circumstances. And whilst the lazy complain, the others are creating opportunities through their kind hearts, generosity, and willingness to get things done. Think about that in terms of uh, Catherine's obedience to her father and the sadness that she endured while waiting to go into the convent um, and all the different things that she lived with through her one brother who ran the restaurant and lived with her uh, brother and sister-in-law who uh, sent her through finishing school and and just, you know, that act of, 
uh, working to get obedience or her, that obedient act of working to get um, permission from her father to enter the convent. Um, she could have done a lot of things, but she was patient, uh, much like this person in the story. And she, even though there were obstacles in her way, um, she she knew that those obstacles would help her achieve the goals that she set out to do. We are doing the fifth of the glorious mysteries, which is the coronation of Mary as queen of heaven and earth. The uh, grace of that mystery is uh, perseverance until death in order to achieve the crown of eternal happiness. And we've been talking about this in class. We've talked about it through a recent retreat where we're all called to holiness. That's in the end, that's all there is. Okay. This, this idea that, um, that, Sometimes it seems like holiness is something that is so hard and it's left only to these extraordinary saints that saw Mary or that, you know, helped millions of poor people and things like that. But we are all called to sainthood. I mean, we don't know what God's mission is for each one of us. But in the end, that's all there is, is sainthood. I mean, at the end of our life, God is going to, um, he's going to ask us, you know, what did you do to further my kingdom? You know, and who did you bring with you? Now, you know, that's not saying that all the stuff in the world is bad. I mean, a lot of the things that we have in our lives are there as vehicles to allow us to be holy within that. And so, but but when those things become uh, preeminent and when they push God out of the way a bit and we start veering off that course to heaven, um, that's when they can become less good. And so we always have to keep um, everything that we're doing focus on God. So it doesn't mean that we need to become all religious mon no, monks and nuns. And I mean, we could, um, but that, that doesn't mean that that's what we are called to do. We are called to live out holiness in our state of life, our individual state of life. And so um, that looks different for each of us. Um, so, so um, but, but our end goal is that crown of glory that we will get when we get to heaven. 